Welcome into another edition of True Crime Tuesday. I'm Tim Dennis. Got a great show for you. We're getting right into it today. I had the opportunity to uh, screen an exciting and uh, captivating uh, new series coming up on Hulu. And I wanted to uh, share it with you guys and and get an opportunity to talk to the director today of this uh, series. Uh, It's called Captive Audience, a real American horror story. And uh, one of the things that is absolutely frightening, especially for parents out there, uh, is the idea that you could lose your child. But even more horrifying would be to get that child back and eventually lose them again and then have more tragedy befall your family. Uh, I'll tell you, folks, I got a chance to sit down and watch this uh, program. And like I said, absolutely horrifying. But what was even... uh, more captivating about the series is the way it was put together. I want to bring in right now the director of this series, uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's bring in to True Crime Tuesday, the director, uh, Jessica Dimock. Uh, Jessica, welcome in to True Crime Tuesday. It's my pleasure to bring you in. Oh, thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Uh, I want to, uh, first of all, uh, kind of talk a little bit about the backstory here about, of, and, and the family we're talking about, which is... Uh, the uh, the story of Stephen Stainer. Now, the time frame being in the uh, the seventies and eighties, which uh, is my my time frame. I'm a little bit of an old codger, and I, I remember I, I remember this this case and and remember it uh, very well. Um, not necessarily the time frame he was abducted, which was of course in the early seventies, um, but. Walk us through just a little bit of sure. Stephen Stainer sure. and, and sure. what had happened with him. Sure. So in 1972, Stephen Stainer was a seven-year-old boy, um, one of five children living in kind of uh, the like gateway to Yosemite Park. Um, and he is coming home from school one day and doesn't come home. And so that's in 1972. Um, this, you know, predates obviously cell phones. It predates closed circuit TV and security cameras and, and so many of the kind of surveillance things that we have in our society that like prevents this type of thing from happening, pre- prevents um, it from going too far. And so at, at that point, um, he goes missing without a trace and no one can find him. And for seven years, um, his parents, especially his mother, um, kept searching for him and really tried to, I think one of the important things here is really try to kind of like keep it alive in the media. She would do kind of yearly um, kind of media events around the date of his abduction, his birthday, Christmas, things like that, um, to just try to see if somewhere, somewhere someone knew something. Um, the man that he, that he was abducted by was... Um, a predator and a pedophile and told the seven-year-old Stephen that he, his parents no longer wanted him and that he had been legally adopted um, by him. And so he changed his name. He moved him to a variety of towns. None of, none of them were that far away. They were all kind of in California. Um, and for seven years, Stephen, um, Stephen lived as Dennis and, you know, I think always knew that something was wrong in that story and remembers being taken, but was also a seven-year-old kid that like didn't have any way to reach home and didn't have any way to verify that story. And then when he's 14, living a somewhat normal life outside of the abuse, his um, abductor kidnaps another child. And I think it's at that moment that the kind of veil and facade is, is lifted and um, and he decides to escape, which is what he did. What's incredibly different about this story, and and I think you'll agree with me, is the fact that one Stephen lives through this thing, something that is unusual by today's standards. Yeah. Um, normally, they say with an abduction, if you don't get that child within even the first twenty four to forty eight hours, don't expect that child to live. And I think um, one of the things that is shown throughout this documentary, and and one of the things that I tip my cap to you uh, about, is Stephen's mother uh, clearly shows that she's given up the idea that Stephen's alive. 
um, throughout uh, parts of this documentary, and I don't think I'm giving much away by saying this, that, that any parent would think, even after a year, after two years, you have to think that, that there's no real uh, hope left there. Um, the other thing that, that I, I noticed throughout the, the documentary is, is and, and I want you to expound on this for me, if you will, a little bit, this is a woman that's been through a lot. She's very, she seems like she's almost yeah, been she's ground down. Yeah. Sp- speak to me a little bit about, about, um, uh, about the mom and, and, and what it is that, that keeps her going after everything she's been through. Well, I think that she is this incredibly strong character who, you know, kind of knows that if she falls apart, she's got four other kids to take care of. Um, She's got a husband who really is kind of an emotional wreck from this. And I think she knows that if she falls apart, then there are so many things other, so many other things that kind of come cascading down. Um, And so she really has to stay strong when, when he is found eventually, when he escapes in in 1980 um, and, and comes home, I, you know, she maintains that she always believed that he would come back. Um, and, you know, but coming back after a seven year old, seven long years of kidnapping isn't just, you know, he doesn't just reinsert himself into the family. There's him, Stephen coming home is in some ways the beginning of kind of the tumultuous years, um, or is definitely a continuation of those tumultuous years. Uh, as, as the story progresses, um, there are, there are some emotional hurdles here. And, and again, I want to kind of give you your flowers here while we have you on, on, on the show. Um, this is so well put together. It, it really is this, 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 uh, this part of, of captive audience. And again, for those of you who are looking for the show, it's on Hulu or coming up on Hulu. Um, and the, the name of the show is captive audience, a real American horror story. Um, Stephen himself, I, I've got to think being renamed and introduced to this uh, to this person or kidnapped by this person, um, and then renamed, and then the psychological torture of trying to remember who you are. And he even states that you know he kept trying to remember who his parents were, his family, trying to hold on to those memories. And those are formative years between seven and fourteen Same when right. he's found. Um, and then trying to reintegrate into the family. And I think he did a brilliant job of trying to show how difficult it was for the family and for him to try and reintegrate and trying to reintegrate into the school, trying to reintegrate into everything as, as, as far as that went. Um, and then there's the media swarm. And we think we have it tough now with the media society. This was a very yeah. unusual case for, at the time in, in the 80s. Um, and there's one scene that's particularly disturbing, uh, and I won't I won't blow it for our audience. I want them to see it. But um, the swarm of media just when he comes home alone, uh, w- there's no way that the media would be able to do what they did. Yeah. Um, and I I was just kind of taken aback by the invasion of privacy that there was at that point. Uh, into the the Stainer household. Um, yeah, yeah. You- well, I mean, I think one of the things that I found so interesting about this story is that you know, for um, I was born in seventy eight, so okay. I don't remember his kidnapping, but I do remember uh, in the mid eighties there being a made for TV movie. Yes, yeah, so I was. I know my first name yep. is Stephen, mm-hmm. and kind of um, that centers around the story, and it was a big media event it was it was like in the heyday of the made for tv movie or the movie of the week um and it was a particularly big one and so i think one of the things that i find found so interesting about this story is that there's like several layers of the media of what we kind of consider media attention there's the first layer which is when he goes missing it's really hard for the media for his mother to keep the media engaged. But when he comes back and when he escapes, it's pretty phenomenal. He also frees a young boy um, who had been missing for two weeks. So that, you know, he is kind of thrust upon the media 
spotlight as as a young hero. Um, and then there's this kind of like made for TV movie version of the story because it right. is such a remarkable story and Hollywood kind of came knocking and wanted to turn that in. And so I think of all of these, like of the many layers of, of media that he and the rest of the family went through. And also this idea of like, which one is his identity? You know, he's a seven year old boy that then is taken for seven very formative years and given another identity. And then in a later iteration, he's, someone is cast as him to mm-hmm. play him mm-hmm. in a movie. And um, and so there are these kind of many different layers and none of them are wrong. It's not to condemn any of them. Um, it's not to condemn the movie version of him. It's not to condemn the seven years that he lived as Dennis. Um, but that on one person, you have like all of these different interpretations and these different stories that can kind of all be on one person at the same time. In the documentary, uh, the documentary is not just told, and, and for our audience, this is not just a rehash of the things that have happened to Stephen or his family, nor is it a rehash of the made-for-TV movie. It really is a telling of the story, not only just from the family's point of view, but you actually bring Stephen's children into it, and you get their perspective. It starts out with them going through Stephen's old pictures and, and memories and what memories they had because they were young uh, and and kind of got to know Stephen, but really didn't get to know Stephen. So they're getting to know him throughout the process of this documentary. Um, so my question to you, Jessica, is is why now? Why are we? What, what was it to try and reverse the damage of the made for TV movie? Because it wasn't exactly all that accurate, was it? Right. Well, there was a few things. One is that. Um, you know, what we tried to do was not just tell the story of what happened, because that had been told many times, but tell the story of the s- stories that had been told about it. And so in the process of making this project, we also found the kind of like behind the scenes, um, so to speak, and the correspondence of making the TV movie, the letters between the executives, the kind of hashing out how certain scenes should go. And that kind of becomes this like integral character so to speak in the series that on top of these stories you also always have this writer kind of questioning well should we do it this way or that way should we move this person up because for our story purposes for our audience it would make so much more sense for our audience it would be easier to understand it this way um and so we wanted to kind of tell this story again with that added layer that's that's happening all of the time it's just not um necessarily blatant and then it was also an opportunity to include the family this is a, the family um you know without giving away many spoilers in in the 80s, Stephen dies. We kind of get to that right away. In the 90s, something else kind of terrible happens within the family Mm -hmm. and something, you know, like a very unexpected turn ends up happening. And so for those reasons, for all of the media attention, for all of the like crazy ins and outs of the story, it's a story that's been told a lot. Um, But it's never really involved the family. And so it, it seems like an opportunity to say it from their perspective and to make them active participants in the telling of the story. And also at the same time, make these kind of outside observers, active participants as well. And to kind of like give the full spectrum of, of the intimacy versus the very, very outside looking in kind of players that, that are factoring in. I have to ask you a question here, Jessica, and this may be kind of a tough one for you to answer, but I have to ask this after after having screened uh, these these episodes. You know, having us having grown up 70s and 80s and it's a different generation now. We have helicopter parents. We have parents that are very attentive and that can be a good thing because after you watch these episodes, you may say to yourself, is the inattentive parenting the reason why we had some of these things happen? Um, do you believe that Steven Stainer's parents are the direct result of some of these things happening that happened in the documentary? No, it's a really great question. No, I really don't think that they're a direct result of what, you know, that they're kind of implicated in any ways. I think if anything, 
the op or part of that question is true, which is that we didn't know that these things can happen until they kind of happen. Like I always think about for the seven years that Stephen was living under a false name as Dennis with his father uh, out in this like boondocky town called Comchi. <laughs> um, these kind of like very off the grid, very salt of the earth, kind of proudly like don't have anything going on in this town. And I've spoken to a lot of the friends that knew Dennis when he was Dennis and like, and the guilt that they uh, feel for not knowing. And I always think to myself, like if I met a, a man who said, this is my son and his mother had died, like why would I, if I met a single father who had a seven year old son, I would never say, oh, that kid's probably abducted. And there's this feeling kind of, I think, in retrospect of looking back and saying, like, how could we have not known? But the reality, especially then, was that, like, this predates the age of the milk carton kids. It predates it's 11 o'clock. Do you know where your parent, where your child is? Um, and I think, if anything, we are more conscious parents right now because Kay and Del Stainer went through something like they did and they got through it and they didn't fall apart and they kind of like stayed together and they were an example also of like what you should do. Um, but I, I think everyone was letting their kids walk home from school. I mean, I think, I think that's just what you did. I, I think that was completely normal. And this was a crime of opportunity that no one could kind of see coming and really wasn't on people's radar. Um, you know, the eighties were an era of a lot of missing children. This early seventies, you know, I, it was it was barely even spoken about as far as I understand. There's a there's a point and I want you to kind of play a what if game with me, if you would. Sure. There's a point where Stephen, again, he's been there for seven years with his captor. Um, he brings in his new, quote unquote, little brother, Timmy. Um, yeah, yeah. And Stephen is more than willing to put up with the lifestyle of being with his captor. Yeah. But when he sees he's brought in another, enough is enough. The premise yeah. that he was brought in under was that he was to help out with the church. Or he was brought mm -hmm. into, you know, well, my mom would, would help out the church. I don't have anything to help with, but my mom would help out the church. But then it was, mm -hmm. well, your dad gave us custody of you. They, don't, they no longer want you. So the idea is a guilt trip to keep you. Um, we're going to take care yeah. of you now. Um, yeah. so from there it's, well, this is your new little brother. He sees the roots. He sees the, he sees the idea that this is now it's a con game. Mm -hmm. My question to you would be, and I know that this is a smart, bright young man, and you can tell mm -hmm. by the way that you've put this together, that he's figuring this out throughout the years, that he's got to know mm -hmm. that his parents love him that they they are they have to mm -hmm. be looking for him why do you think it took timmy or to come in for him to decide that i have a partner that i can grab and get out of the house why not sooner why why not at the age of 12 did he decide you know what i'm going to strike out on my own and make the move and get out of here it's a great question um i think i think um, I don't assume that he did know during that time that her, his parents must have loved him and were looking for him. I think about the emotional devastation of a child who had coincidentally gotten in trouble the Friday before. Not big trouble, but he had gone over to his friend's house. His father had gotten frustrated with him. He had been scolded about it. I can imagine the kind of emotional manipulation that happens for a seven-year-old. That's And uh, you're one of five kids and you're told, they just don't have the resources for you. You're too expensive to take care of. They don't want you anymore. You were a bad boy. Um, so I don't know that I could break, you know, the unknown, it, you know, dealing with your circumstances in that situation, horrific, horrific, but the kind of unknown of what if this man is telling me the truth, I think is, is maybe even the most painful thing you can imagine as a kid. I think it's also kind of 
realizing that he didn't have to accept it, that once he saw the kind of innocence of another five-year-old boy to kind of understand um, just the vile nature of the crime, just like how cruel and selfish the crime is. And I think once he saw that another little kid was faced with it, that was his breaking point. I mean, Kay, his mother, you know, people often re refer to Stephen having saved Timmy, but, you know, Kay kind of sees it the other way around, which is that Timmy saved Stephen, that without Timmy coming along, she doesn't know that he ever would have escaped and that he ever would have found them. Um, and Parnell had a bit of a violent history, so it's quite possible that he was, you know, Parnell might have eventually done something with him. Um, but yeah, I mean, Kay definitely feels like it was Timmy that saved Stephen and, and not only not only the other way around. There's a point in the documentary and and, and I'm going to ask this question and, and this may seem like an odd question to ask you, but follow me here and, and see if if you agree with me. Is Timmy the beginning of Stephen's turn in life in a way and getting over the way that his parents raised him it is timmy the spark of steven's paternal instinct and does that make him a better father maybe than his parents were to him or a better a better set of parents do you know what i'm saying is yeah. that actually it, the the it's catalyst an it's well, it's an interesting question. I mean, I'm always struck by I've watched so many of the press conferences where Timmy and Stephen are are kind of first seen together. And yeah, mind yeah. you, this is before Stephen has been reunited with his own family. There are press conferences that following morning, like immediately, Stephen has not seen his parents yet. Yep. And he's a 14 year old kid. And he kind of comes in and they're there together. And there's this way that he picks Timmy up and plops him on his lap. Yes. And it's so Oh, it's so paternal. It is yes. so yes. it's beyond it's very big brother ish. It's even beyond that. It's so comfortable and, and caretaking. And it's like, you know, I know adults that aren't quite as comfortable. And so I think your question is right, which is that it, there is this in, incredible um, protective and paternal instinct that that happens in him right away. And they had, they had only been together for two weeks, but there is a way that, you know, it's very clear that not only did he save Timmy physically, but he also saved Timmy mentally. Like during that time, you got a little five-year-old that was a, a quite a different kid than Stephen was when he was abducted. So this little five-year-old is like, he has not taken it. He like, Stephen had been told, oh, the pay phone doesn't work. He didn't know how to use his own phone number, his he didn't remember his own phone number. He didn't know how to contact his parents. He was quite timid in all this. This little boy, Timmy, is not having it. He is like, that's not my dad. I want out of here. Where is my mommy? You know, he is like, and he's distraught. He's so upset. And, and Stephen, during this time, really keeps him calm, plays games with him, gives him comic books, but also this whole while is kind of hatching a plan. And so I think that's kind of, you know, the best kind of caregiver you could be. Right. Um, and I and I it's very clear that even during the brief years that he was alive during his own children's life, um, that he was a great dad. And I think in that Timmy brings out something in Stephen that's almost like coming of age, like like he yeah. accelerates him from being a child into, you know what, it's time now for me to grow up. It's time now yeah. for me to take take action where before I couldn't. Um, yeah. Almost like yeah. putting a, a sense of bravery into him where he didn't yeah. have it. Yeah. Yeah. It's really well said. That's, that's totally right. Um, and, and you've, you've kind of expounded on, on the fact that, that Stephen does eventually pass away. Tell me a little bit about, uh, I, I I'm, I'm almost hesitate to, to talk about his wife, but do you, uh, and you know what? Let's talk about his kids. Uh, let's let's get off the wife subject for a second. Let's let's talk about his kids. I want to talk about. He does end up having two children, uh, uh, yeah. a son and daughter. Um, I want to ask you specifically about the daughter. The daughter, fe I feel like she feels a certain connection to him that, um, I think belies the age and the amount of time that she had with with. Uh, Stephen, do yeah. you do you feel like uh, oh, what's a good way to put this? Do you feel like 
there is a there was an, a, a proper amount of time put there that there was a sufficient amount of bond put there or is she reaching to find as much material to hold on to him um in yeah. memories do you know what i'm saying is she is it's she it's a good question i mean th- there's a difference between her and her brother which is that ashley was was quite young when her father passed away but she does have memories of him mm-hmm. whereas the brother does not he doesn't have any memories and you know i've got a little girl i've got a four and a half year old um that's younger than ashley was when her father passed away but i know that during making this my daughter my daughter was younger and I would often think about the kind of bond that we had. And even if there weren't memories attached to that bond, that bond is very much there, but she's also dealing with a father who has kind of been immortalized in a variety of tellings. And this was one of the things I found so fascinating is that like when Ashley thinks of her father, she also pictures Corin Nemec, the actor who played him in the made for TV movie. Yeah, She yeah. thinks she has a kind of stand it. You know, this is something that no one else has if, if they've lost a parent early. It's one thing to lose a parent early. It's another thing to like lose a parent so early, but there is a kind of, there's a movie about them. And so I was so interested in that idea. Obviously she knows that Corn isn't her dad, but she also under, like she also knows that she has a kind of, automatic reaction to seeing him and to saying, well, that that's my dad because he's a stand in for something that she didn't ever get to fully access. Um, and I was really interested in that idea and like where her kind of memory comes in and where the retelling of his story comes in and how those two things kind of interact. Does she have a relationship with him at all with Corin? With Corin? No, but she, there's a moment in, um, you know, there's a moment that she says to me and she gets kind of choked up. Like if, if I could ever meet Corin, I'd like to give him a hug. Cause he kind of reminds me of my dad. And like, I get choked up even saying it. It's just, yeah. you know, it's so clearly that he is, he is, um, he represents something to her, you know, and I told Corin that we work with him in the film and I told him that, and, you know, I think he was very moved by that as well. That is quite moving. You know, I, I got I got the feeling watching this that there are some solid memories. There are some some very good memories she has of her father, but she is searching. She's searching for more of her father. And the fact that, you know, in those opening scenes, there's, you know, articles and, and pictures and things strewn about. And the two of them are, are reminiscing. You can tell there's a definite disconnect of 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 his son um, from the father because there, there's nothing there, but, but I shouldn't say there's nothing there, but, but there is, there's something there. Uh, yeah, but yeah. that the daughter is really reaching for something. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, again, Jessica, I, I have to, like I said, I have to give you your flowers. I have to, I have to oh, give thanks. you kudos because I really did as much as you can enjoy a true crime documentary. Um, this is more than just, reporting the facts, putting it out there. It really is giving an all around sense of, of what is, um, what is going on there. Uh, the name of the documentary once again is a uh, captive audience, a real American horror story. And again, when does this debut on Hulu? April 21st, April 21st is when you can catch it folks. And I highly recommend that you, uh, if you're not subscribed to Hulu to get subscribed to Hulu right now and uh, be prepared for it because uh, it's got some tear jerking moments in it. It does have some heartwarming moments in it, and it is a uh, captivating story. And it has some twists and turns here, folks, that make you go, "Oh my gosh!" You just sure can't does. believe where this story ends up. And uh, we saved the best for the actual final chapter in this story, uh, which completely made me shake my head after everything that the family had been through. And I really do feel sorry uh, for the mom in the story as well. Uh, Jessica Dimmock has been our, uh, our guest. Jessica, thank you so much for joining us here on True Crime 2. Thank you. Folks, like Jessica said, Captive Audience, a real American horror story, debuts on April 21st on Hulu. And I got a chance to screen uh, chapters 1, 2, and 3 uh, last night. And it was amazing. It was an amazing story. It's not your typical true crime 
documentary and that you get a fully rounded look at uh, this story as told by the family. It's not uh, it's not told by an outside source. Uh, you basically get to sit down with Ashley and Stephen Stainer Jr., who are the children of Stephen Stainer. And they sit down and they give you what little memories they have. They're basically sitting down in the living room and uh, they're going through uh, some memories of what they have of Stephen. Uh, Stephen's mother is in that as well. And Stephen's wife, uh, widow, is in the documentary. Uh, there's some painful things in there. There's some some real pain that's that's brought back. Uh, there's also a twist in that third episode. That third episode is an entire twist we didn't go over. And it has to do with some missing people in Yosemite. Now, keep in mind that this takes place in Merced, California, right on the edge of Yosemite Park, uh, Yosemite National Park. And some people go missing years to, or two decades after Stephen went missing near Yosemite. Three tourists vanished from the same area. And as the FBI investigates, there's some ties to the stainers there. That's all I'm going to tell you. That third episode will shock you. Absolutely shocking. That's all I can say. April 21st is when this comes out on Hulu. You definitely don't want to miss this. If you don't have Hulu, by all means, go out, get your subscription to Hulu. Check this out, folks. I I got to tell you, the way it's put together, it's it's put together really well. Um, Corin Nemec, who, is, who plays Steven Stainer in... I know my first name is Steven from the uh, the miniseries, the uh, the biopic that that was on TV back in 1989. It's also uh, in the or in this uh, documentary. Uh, Ted Rollins, who is a court TV reporter, is in this as well. Uh, there's some great uh, footage from back in the day that's put in here. Uh, Jessica Dimmick, our guest, uh, absolutely did an amazing job directing this uh i was captivated from beginning to end i i can't say enough about this by all means go out get hulu check this out check out this uh this documentary i can't say enough about it it uh it was it was uh, an enjoyable uh viewing so captive audience a real american horror story uh check that out on hulu all right, folks, we're going to change gears. We're going to bring in our buddy, Jessica Freeberg, and we're going to do a little ripped from the headlines. Ripped from the headlines. Do you remember when you learned that your father murdered Jeffrey Dahmer? Yes. Um, it was about 10, I saw it on TV, and that's how I found out. So. Ripped from the headlines. A suspected serial killer behind bars tonight in Missouri. Cops say they think he killed six people and shot several others across two states in September and late October. Ripped from the headlines. Tonight, an unsolved cold case. A 20-year-old woman kidnapped, raped, and killed in 1980 in New York. Now closed. Ripped from the headlines. It's time now for Ripped from the Headlines with our good friend Jessica Freeberg. Hey, Jess. Howdy, Tim. Uh, just catch people up real quick because I know we haven't had you on the free version of uh, True Crime Tuesday in a while, have we? No, we have not. I'm super stoked to be here. Well, I know you've been on uh, you've been on um, Supernatural News. We've had you on Supernatural News, which went out on the, on the free version. But it's it's good to have you on uh, True Crime Tuesday. Uh, the way uh, ripped from the headlines works is we do, we're just taking. Uh, stories that people uh, may not be familiar with because, you know, other things are dominating the headlines. We've we've still got the pandemic thing that's uh, waxing and waning. Uh, we've got, of course, the war over in, in Ukraine, which, you know, is, is rightfully so taking over uh, headlines as the entire world is kind of teetering on the edge right now. So yeah. we've got yes. that, that going on as well. Uh, so we... Uh, We've decided we're going to take some true crime stories that have been going on that you may or may not be familiar with. Uh, there's certain things going on in certain states. Uh, so we'll uh, we'll bring them up for you right now. This one going on in Georgia. A mystery of a 1982 murder may be solved. Ooh. Yeah. Authorities in Georgia are charging Marcellus McCluster, which is an ominous name in itself, 
and the death of Rene Don Blackmore. This going all the way back to 1982, as I mentioned. A long unsolved mur- murder of an army pi- private in Georgia may have been cracked. Authorities in Georgia have charged Marcellus McCluster, 64 years old, with the killing of Renee Don Blackmore in 1982 when she was a private at Fort Benning. That, according to Fox 8, the 20-year-old Blackmore vanished while returning to her barracks on the night of April 29th, 1982, according to the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. Her sweater and wallet turned up a month later on the side of the road in Cassetta, less than 20 miles from Fort Benning. Uh, her, rem- her remains were found in June of that year by a logging road, and authorities say she was killed by a shotgun blast. Uh, the 64-year-old McCluster, who was already in prison on an unrelated murder conviction from 1983, actually surfaced as a suspect within a year of Blackmore's death. Uh, however, the case stalled and no charges were filed. A special cold case unit made up of retired investigators re-examined the case with Army investigators and others, though the team has not yet specified what led to the new charges. There is no expiration date on that kind of evil, said Kimberly Schwartz and assistant district attorney for the Chattahoochee Judicial Circuit at a news conference announcing the development. Chattahoochee Judicial Circuit. How Just would you say like? that three times fast. Oh, my gosh. That's that's worse <laughs> than saying Candyman three times fast. Oh, no, don't do that. <laughs> oh. uh, interesting how, uh, and, and, you know, I'm aware of the fact that there are cold case investigators that do go around and try to reopen cold cases from time to time in different areas of the country. But interesting that, that a case from 1982 being reopened and actually being solved. Yeah, fascinating. It makes you wonder if there's something to do with the DNA that linked him back, you know, really substantially to the case. It does. It does. Uh, they, they're they very vague about it, probably because it's still uh, in in the process of being solved. But yeah. Interesting, interesting in that. I have a disturbing uh, story here for you, Jess. Uh, one that uh, makes you think it's probably not worth it at times to be a teacher. Oh, I used to be a teacher. Well, good thing you got out. <laughs> this will make me happy that I changed careers. Let's hear it. Yeah, this one is brutal. It comes out of Las Vegas. A Las Vegas teen is accused of sexually assaulting and strangling a teacher because he was upset over his grades. Oh, whoa, that's a new level. Yeah, yeah, it is. A uh, 16-year-old high school student is accused of attacking his teacher. This was last week because he was upset over his grades. According to the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department, on Thursday, April 7th at approximately 3.30 p.m., officers responded to a high school on the 1100 block of North Lynn Lane regarding an injured teacher. The victim was reportedly being treated by other medical personnel for multiple injuries uh, when police arrived, and she was transported to University Medical Center in stable condition. The Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department's Sexual Assault Division investigated the incident and reportedly discovered the victim, who remained unnamed, uh, was in her classroom when the 16-year-old suspect walked in the room to discuss his grades. According to the statement, the student got violent and began punching the victim and strangled her as, until she lost consciousness. Holy cow. I can't even read that sentence straight. Dang. That's, wow. Uh, the suspect allegedly fled the classroom after the attack. This, according to KLAS-TV, a janitor found the teacher in the classroom. The teen is reportedly a student at El Dorado High School. Uh, He was reportedly located and booked into Clark County Detention Center for attempted murder, sexual assault, battery with intent to commit sexual assault, first-degree kidnapping, and robbery. Clark County School District Superintendent Jesus Hara, I believe it is, uh, said in a statement he is devastated about what happened and reiterated in a previous statement of his violent acts, assaults, and bullying will not be tolerated in the Clark County School District, and those who choose to engage in these activities will be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. The suspect's bail is set at $500,000, which I don't think is hardly enough. No, no. I hope he, I hope he has to stand there until his case is heard and he doesn't get out for a long time. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, d- 
just amazing. And that isn't the only crime out of Las Vegas, believe it or not. Well, that I do believe, yet this Yet this week. <laughs> the city of sin. <laughs> sin city, yes, the city of sin, definitely. Uh, also out of Las Vegas, a 28-year-old man was recently arrested after allegedly Get this, this it, it just her, her, another horrific crime, stabbing a three-year-old girl 11 times. Oh, that just makes my heart hurt. It does, and, and the worst reason possible. Uh, according to the Las Vegas Review-Journal, on Thursday, March 31st, Alan Wilson allegedly stabbed the child seven times in the back, once in the armpit, once in the hand, and twice in the arm. After the stabbing, Wilson allegedly fled the scene, uh, the victim reportedly endured artery damage, kidney injuries, and injuries to her spleen that required surgeries. Uh, family members allegedly tried to pull the knife away from Wilson, and he said, I need to get the demons out of her. I need oh. to save her. That makes me sick. Oh, that is poor baby. Completely terrible. A three year old. Keep that in mind, folks. Uh, according to the Las Vegas Journal, or Review Journal, the victim's grandfather, the suspect's stepfather, made the 911 call. It was reportedly not made clear what Wilson's relationship is to the victim. According to, again, KLAS-TV, authorities found Wilson outside of a business near Nellis and Charleston Boulevards. Uh, Wilson was reportedly arrested and charged with attempted murder and battery with use of a deadly weapon. Wilson was booked into Clark County Detention Center on <laughs> God, only two hundred and fifty thousand dollars bail. Keep in mind, come he only on. has to yeah, he only has to come up with ten percent himself, um, according to jail records, and also according to KLAS, Wilson had previously served prison time for battery. Oh man! Yeah, so that is tragic. Tragic indeed. So two cases out of. Uh, out of Las Vegas. So again, this is ripped from the headlines. These are uh, these are cases that you might or might not have heard of uh, as the regular news cycle continues on. Just some cases that are of interest that are out there on the true crime scene. A state that has a lot going on, Jess, and 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 uh, one that if you just want to delve into the ick of true crime, will always. Never fail to disappoint. <laughs> uh, since we're delving into just some sick stories, a New York man arrested after allegedly dragging an 81-year-old woman with a vehicle. Oh, man, Tim. These I know. Are, these are harsh. We're, but see, we're going to get into the premium, the Stitcher premium side of things with dumb, dumb crime, stupid criminals. And I promise you we're going to lighten okay. things up. We've got some, right. we got some great stories with dumb crime, stupid criminals today. <laughs> Did I mention we're going to end things on a kinky note with dumb crime, stupid criminals today? <laughs> I'm ready for that. We, okay. We've got a lot of tragedy against the young people and yeah. the civil servant people and the elderly. All right, yeah. what happened? Why did this guy do this? What was his motivation here? We go to Cheektowaga, I believe, is the name of the town in New York. I think it's probably upstate. Uh, a 32-year-old man stands accused of trying to steal an 81-year-old woman's purse and subsequently dragging her with a moving car. Oh, man. All for a purse. For, all for a purse. Jeez. Uh, according to a press release from the Erie County District Attorney's Office, on Tuesday, April 5th at approximately 5.15 p.m., Michael Sawyer of Buffalo attempted to steal the victim's purse outside a grocery store on Harlem Road near Kensington Avenue. The district attorney's office says the defendant, while driving a vehicle, allegedly grabbed the handles of the bag as the victim held on to the purse. Ah, she should have let it go. Yeah, uh, let it go. Yeah. The victim was reportedly dragged, fell, and suffered severe injuries. According to the district attorney's office, authorities found Sawyer's car parked on Miller Avenue near Broadway in Buffalo, uh, Sawyer allegedly tried to flee the scene, but he was taken into custody following a short chase. According to the district attorney's office, as of April 6th, the victim remains hospitalized. Uh, of course, that was a few days ago. Uh, Sawyer was arraigned April 6th on one count of first-degree assault and one count of first-degree attempted robbery. The district attorney's office says uh, Sawyer is reportedly scheduled to appear in court again 
on Monday, April 11th, which was yesterday, and he remains held on $200,000 bail. What's with all the low bails on all these horrific crimes? It's a little disturbing. I mean, cost of inflation, Jess. We should be, (laughs) you know, let's up these bails, you know? I can barely afford the Cheerios, but I can get out on bail. Right, exactly. But you can skip bail, you know, on on (laughs) any horrific crime you want. Uh, According to the district attorney's office, Sawyer could face a maximum sentence of 25 years in prison if convicted. Doesn't seem like enough for an 81-year-old lady, that's for sure. Uh, On April 6th, the district attorney's office says Sawyer was arraigned on separate charges involving another case including unlawful fleeing of a police officer in the motor vehicle, uh, reckless endangerment, reckless driving, and aggravated unlicensed operation of a motor vehicle. Additionally, the district attorney's office says Sawyer has a third pending criminal case, like the two weren't enough, which he was arraigned December 22nd, 2021, on charges of unlawful fleeing of a police officer in a motor vehicle, obstruction of governmental administration, Reckless driving and aggravated, unlicensed operation of a motor vehicle. Maybe staying away from motor vehicles is in Mr. Sawyer's future. Hopefully so. He doesn't sound like he's very responsible with them. No, not at all. Um, this case that we're about to talk about has a little bit of a upside to it. All right. I, if, I'm ready for it. If there's such a thing. Uh, 15 years after a teen's murder, her roommate is charged. So they may have found the the actual killer. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, This one taking place to our neighbors just to the north and west of us uh, over in North Dakota, you know. (laughs) Said like a true Minnesotan. I did, didn't I? (laughs) Uh, Have you you made the trips to the Dakotas? Have I ever told you my story about why I refused to go there? No, I have made the trips because my son was looking at a college there to play football and he didn't end up going. It was too far away. Okay, which is good. Um, <laughs> did he get bored silly by the trip and in, in the the landscape by chance? Well, it was definitely. I mean, a lot of sunflower fields and then random giant hay bales everywhere. Yes. Yep. Yeah, and mm-hmm. nothing. No towns anywhere. You just drove and drove and drive. I was like, if we run out of gas, we are so in trouble right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's like 100 miles to the nearest gas station. Yeah, Yeah. it's crazy. It's beautiful with the sunflowers, though. I mean, I I kind of was digging those, but. Well, it's God's country, that's for sure. But God's the only one who lives there, besides maybe a few people. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, that that might have been the biggest reason he chose to go elsewhere for college. (laughs) I I think so. I, I, you know, I, when I was, when I was a small child, I, I had a, I had one, one of my best friends, his, his, uh, I knew I had relatives that lived up there because my grandparents would always say to me, do you want to go with us to North Dakota to go see, you know, cousins and relatives? And I'd go, no. And they'd say, well, why? <laughs> and I said, because my friend Lonnie had relatives that he went to go see every summer. And, and Lonnie would come back and I'd say, how was North, North Dakota? And he said, it's a long trip up there because I think it's like six, seven hours or something to where he was going. Mm-hmm. And he said, there's nothing there but a Dairy Queen and a walled drug. <laughs> and that's it. That's that's all you have to look forward to. Yeah. And if there's I, no Target, I'm out. I can't live without a Target. Right. right. If, if there's not a Target, if there's not, um, you know, if, if there's not something to look at, then why bother? Right? Yeah. And I'm like, well, I can get Dairy Queen here, and I don't know what the heck a walled drug is, but I'm not going. <laughs> you know? And if and they had a bumper sticker on their car, something about a wall drug, so obviously it, it was worth it was bumper sticker worthy. Wow, if I didn't, they don't make bumper stickers for Walgreens, do they? Or CVS? no, yes, no. See, because it's not that ah. big of a deal. You just go pick up your prescription, you come back, you're good, right? But if if a drugstore is your big your big economic center, I, I can't hang. Yeah. You know, and they don't have clothes or shoes there. I, I would be in trouble. Yeah, exactly. I saw so I, I couldn't do it. Uh, so we go to North Dakota, where 15 years after a teen's murder, her, her roommate is charged. Uh, police arrest 34 year old Nicole Rice in connection with the fatal stabbing of 18 year old Anita Knutson. That's how we pronounce it in Minnesota. It might be Knutson for all the rest of you, but there's a K in it. So we say <laughs> Knutson. 
in uh, Minot, North Dakota. Uh, nearly 15 years after that North Dakota teen was found murdered in her home, a crack has finally been made in the case. Uh, police in Minot say that 34-year-old Nicole Rice has been arrested in connection with uh, 18-year-old Anita Knudsen's killing after more than 10 years in which there was no person of interest, little evidence, and a murder victim with no justice per KXMB. The Minot State University freshman was found dead in her bedroom on June 4th, 2007, after her dad, Gordon Knudsen, hadn't heard from her in a few days, drove to her apartment and saw a bloodstained mattress through the window. Uh, he had told that to Crime Watch Daily in an earlier interview. Uh, police say Anita Knudsen, was, who was found in her bed with a house coat placed over her, had been stabbed to death. Knudsen's family wasn't happy about the years-long investigation that followed, claiming that law enforcement botched the search to find her killer. On Wednesday, Minot Police Chief John Klug announced that his team finally had a suspect. Rice, who had gone to high school with Knudsen and was Knudsen's roommate at the time of her murder, uh, per Inforum, it says, which must be another magazine, uh, when the probe into the killing initially began, Rice is said to have told police uh, she was with her family the weekend before Knudsen was found, but according to an affidavit of probable cause for Rice, police found remarks by both Rice and her parents to be inconsistent and contradictory. Uh, those who knew both young women also labeled Rice as hot-tempered and reactionary. Isn't that most teenagers? I mean, I, I, I mind you, she's 34 now, but... Yes, but a lot of girls in their teen years. Interestingly, Tim, that is actually where my son and I went for his college visit, and this case actually came up in conversation when we were visiting the school, and I can't remember how... If me and my morbid curiosity of all, you know, things creepy asked someone about open cases or something like that, but somehow this case came up and we were chatting about this exact case before there was any resolution to it. So it's really cool to hear that they finally got someone. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, Knudsen's mom, Sharon Knudsen, said Anita was scared of her, interestingly enough. Uh, in the earlier interview, noting her daughter had planned to move out of the apartment she shared with Rice, uh, but police say they didn't have enough evidence to charge Rice until earlier this month when they were able to track down her ex-boyfriend, whom Rice allegedly confessed the crime to. Uh, per the affidavit, Rice was arrested Wednesday uh, while at her civilian job at Minot Air Force Base. Uh, wow, she joined the Air Force, too, so she... She had oh, a little man. rough and tumble to her as well. Uh, police haven't yet arrested or revealed a motive, rather. Uh, Rice, who was released from Ward County Jail after posting a $120,000 bond. It's cheaper to get arrested in North Dakota, too. Should've. I didn't think it could get cheaper. Uh, it can <laughs> if you get arrested in North Dakota. Uh, faces life in prison without chance of parole. There we go. Now we got a sentence. That's she, fair. Yeah, that is fair. If she's convicted of the felony charge of intentional murder against her so there you go that's that's the story there uh let's see here i think we've got one or two more stories left here on ripped from the headlines 33 years later the days in killer has been identified jess uh, dna analysis leads to a cold case resolution and points the finger at a dead man. You never want to point any fingers at any dead man because it looks weird when you're doing this. You can't see me. It's not on camera. <laughs> I was going to say, it seems kind of rude. Yeah, Ooh, that's, you're not, it's probably not the wrong. pointing fingers at people. Yeah, that's the wrong finger to point at somebody, I think, especially <laughs> a dead person. Um, yeah. Uh, we go to, uh, where are we going to? I don't know where we're going to. We're going to the Days Inn. That's where we're going to. Uh, in 1987, Vicki Heath was murdered in Kentucky. That's where we're going. Uh, two years later, Margaret Peggy Gill and Jean uh, Gilbert were killed in Indiana. Uh, more than three decades later, Indiana State Police say they have identified the man who murdered them and sexually assaulted another woman in Indiana in 1989. Uh, Harry Edward Greenwell, who died in Iowa in 2013 at age 68, is the man who is known as the I-65 or Days Inn Killer. He targeted night clerks at motels along the Interstate 65 corridor, according to the New York Times. Uh, Heath, 42, was found behind the Super 8 motel 
where she worked, and Gil, who was 24 at the time, was found in a vacant wing of the Days Inn where she worked. And just two and a half hours later, 34-year-old Gilbert was abducted from another Days Inn and was found in a ditch 15 miles away. All had been sexually assaulted and shot. Uh, There was no witnesses to any of the crimes, but in 1990, another clerk at a third Days Inn reported being raped at knife point at a robbery at the motel and gave authorities a description of the suspect. In the two Indiana murders, $426 had been stolen from the motels. Even so, that suspect was not connected to the earlier murders, but years later, investigators used genetic genealogy to match Greenwell's DNA to ancestry records and determined that he was responsible for the three murders as well as the 21-year-old's clerk's attack in 1990 they are still investigating what they say is a likely possibility he was behind other murders rapes and robberies in the midwest greenwell had an extensive criminal history stretching from 1963 to 1998 including armed robbery sodomy burglary and two prison sentences and two escapes by the way from custody oh so he had a little magician in him as well (laughs) I mean, if he had a little magician in him, it'd be a little payback for him. But other than that, (laughs) just saying. Finally, on Rip from the Headlines, Jess, they caught a man who faked his own death in 2016. All right, let's go. Doesn't work like it does in the movies, unfortunately. (laughs) Uh, Jacob Greer arrested six years after allegedly writing a suicide note. Interestingly enough... Uh, An Iowa man who faked his own death to avoid standing trial on child pornography charges has been arrested some six years later after the fact. The arrest of Jacob Greer after six years is a testament to the tenacity of Deputy U.S. Marshals and our investigative partners. Ted Kamachis, the U.S. Marshal for the Southern District of Iowa, said in a release per the Washington Post, even though the case went cold, they would not quit. The 28-year-old Greer had been out on bond for a month living with his grandmother in Des Moines when authorities say he removed his ankle monitor on May 31st of 2016. Authorities eventually came upon his car with what looked like it was a suicide note inside, but they weren't convinced that Greer was dead. A federal arrest warrant was issued, and within a week, investigators discovered Greer had fled the state with money, a bow, arrows, and a backpack full of survival gear. According to the release, investigators also learned that Greer was a survivalist and had plans to live off of the land in remote areas of the upper western states or southern Canada, hiding out in abandoned cabins. They traced another of his vehicles to a secluded campground in northern Montana, not far from the U.S.-Canada border, and a Walmart where Greer had been spotted on June 3rd of 2016 per the AP but it was nearly six years before the man himself was ultimately found. He was arrested this past week in Spanaway, Washington, just south of Tacoma, uh, Tacoma, rather, according to the U.S. Marshal Service. He's now being held at a federal detention center in Seattle ahead of his extradition to Iowa, where he is to stand trial on charges he knowingly, er, that he knowingly received child pornography between June of 2013 and November of 2014. Well, it sounds like he hid for a while. I mean, I, I try to fake my own death at least once a week when the kids want help with math, but they always <laughs> find me. Well, see, I, I think you got to do a better job at your suicide note. Not, uh, <laughs> dear kids, dinner will be on in a week. I mean, that you know, that you got to you gotta tell them that you're really going for real. And, I'm really gone. Yeah. I'm really gone. Well, I tell them I'm haunting them when I come back to make dinner, but they don't buy it. They find me in my office every time hiding under my desk. Yeah, see, so you, you, get, you have to actually leave the house. That's that's the thing. <sighs> I'll try that next time. A yeah. little survival bag. Is that what he had? Yeah, he had, a, he had it all figured out. He had a backpack, a bow and arrow, like he was doing right. the Dukes of Hazard thing. and Hiding out in some empty, abandoned cabins. And that sounds kind of fun to the ghost hunter inside of me. But it, Well, it does until you realize you have to live <laughs> off the land. Yeah. You live off the <laughs> land and go to Walmart. It just doesn't like, sound like a good deal. Where's Target? Yeah, exactly. Where's Target? And they'll find find you in a target that's where most cops start looking they don't want to start at walmart because then they have to they'd be arresting people all day if they were at walmart and they're just arresting everyone yeah they they start at target because it's you know it's nice you can go in they've got all the popcorn at target's amazing so that's where they start 
Yeah, I'm just saying. So that'll <laughs> do it for a rip from the headlines. And we'd like to uh, we'd like to thank our guest from earlier today. We want to remind you about Captive Audience, um, a real American horror story. It comes out April 21st on Hulu. And uh, again, our, our guest today was Jessica Dimock, who is the director of that that uh, story. Uh, you're going to want to check it out on Hulu. If you don't have Hulu, go ahead and subscribe. April 21st is when that biography of uh, Stephen Stainer comes out. And again, that third episode has a huge twist that has to do with a connection to the Stainer family and three missing bodies at Yosemite National Park. So you're going to want to check that out. All right, it's a time where if you're listening to the free version of the show, we must bid you adieu. But if you don't want to leave us right now, you don't necessarily have to. What you can do is you can go to Stitcher.com, click on the subscribe button under Stitcher Premium. That will get you to listen to Dumb Crime, Stupid Criminals. That'll get you to listen to the ad-free version of Darkness Radio. And that'll get you to listen to hundreds of podcasts Ad free and expand your audio horizons more than you could possibly ever imagine. And the best thing is you can do it for just $5 a month. Do it right now. Go to stitcher.com, click on that premium button, subscribe to Stitcher Premium for just $5 a month. You'll get Dumb Crime, Stupid Criminals as far as True Crime Tuesday. You'll get an ad free darkness radio. And of course, you'll get hundreds of podcasts ad free and expand those audio horizons. Go ahead and do it today.